Next week is Mother's birthday, and Susan and Jimmy Bray are getting a present for her. Do you really think she'll like it? I think she will, Jim. Jimmy wants to be the one to drop it into the slot. He's careful to put it into the right slot to help the post office do its work. What, a, what an incredible morning, huh? Just seeing God rescue and seeing what God does, it's, uh, it's just mind-boggling. Um, and as Chris just mentioned, it's been an incredible week around here. Uh, there's a big vote this week, as you just heard. What you may not have heard yet is that um, I've already been moved prayerfully to accept the call to senior pastor here. So, <laughs> Stop. Thank you. You know, this is, this is such a humbling experience, and maybe you've been through something like this in your life. This is, this is the most humbling thing I've probably ever been through. Uh, just, to, just to follow the leadership of a guy like Stephen Hauer, who has been an awesome man of God here in this place. Yeah, it's, uh, we're going to be able to celebrate that in a couple of weeks. Um, he's staying around for three years, and I'm excited about that, that I get to keep him as a, as a friend and a colleague and as a mentor uh, for the next three years. And, um, and, and yet, uh, I'm still just so, so humbled, so sobered, so grateful, and so excited about our future because I know that God is favoring this church, and I know that God's favor is something that he is doing. It's not about any of us. It's really about what he's doing for us, and, and I'm excited about the future. Now, um, some would say that, man, this, this is a great honor, right, being, being uh, called to be the senior pastor of a church like this at age 38. And you know what? I would agree. I'm, I'm honored. Um, although some of you would look back at where you were at 38, and you had already bought out your third competitor at 38 and, you know, put a bunch of people out of business and made a corporate empire, and you're like, hey, this is nothing. And, you know, it's all relative, I guess. But what this process has reminded me of is it's reminded me of, of another process I went through um, about nine years ago. It was the first call I had after I had left seminary. So I was in Michigan, and I was serving in a church there. I'd been there for almost three years, and your first call is really a placement. So I was, I was placed in this church in Michigan, and I received the first call to another church that I had ever received, and it was the call to be a senior pastor at a church in Kansas City, Kansas. Now, what made this call so difficult was not only that it was my first call, but this was a great church. They worshiped somewhere between seven and 800 people on a weekend. They had a great new facility. God was moving there. They had a, an incredible staff assembled. Um, they were in a great part of the country in Overland Park, Kansas, Johnson County, Kansas, which is just a great community to live in, much like ours. Um, it, was, it was very, very difficult to wade through that call, not only because it was my first one, but honestly, I'm just going to be blunt with you today, it, it was difficult for me because I couldn't get the prestige of this whole thing out of my head. See, here I was, I was, I was 29 years old when I first interviewed for the job, and I had not been out of seminary for, for three years, and here this church was calling me to be their senior pastor. It, it was just an incredible opportunity. And, and I knew that if I took the opportunity, I'd be on the fast track. You know, people would talk about that. I would, I would get noticed. It would probably put my career in, in a great spot. It would, it would make all of my seminary classmates envious, which would be kind of fun sometimes, you know. Because I'm sure they got better grades than me, but, uh, and ironically, most of my seminary classmates, they've already accepted positions as senior pastor. I'm kind of the last one, so, so they may be laughing at me, but I say, I say good things come to those who wait, right? Um, that's how I see it at least. But I remember, I remember going through this process, and, and I remember just, just, just being so swept up in it. And one day, it was right before I was rendering my decision, I went on a prayer walk because I, I thought that's what you're supposed to do, and it's a good thing to do. And so I went and spent a few hours walking in a park. I'm just praying to God, and, and I didn't even feel like I needed to do this because I knew what I should do. I mean, here was this opportunity. I could, I could use my gifts. I could still work in the church. It was a great church. There was no reason that it would not be a good place for me. Um, it, was, it, was a, it was a better salary, better position, more influence. It made so much sense to me that I should take this, this offer, this call, and go and move there. And, and so, you know, I'm praying, but I'm frankly going through the motions as I'm praying because it's so obvious to me. And as I'm praying and as I'm walking, um, I remember 
hearing God, not, not audibly, sort of like what Amanda said in her video. It, it wasn't audibly as if he was there with me, but, but these words came crashing into my soul and into my mind and into my heart, and I, I think they could be no, no other words than words from God. And the words were this. I'll, I still remember this question so vividly. The question was this. Do you want to build your career or your character? I resented that question. Because it seemed to me like a false dichotomy, right? I mean, w w what's the difference? I mean, can't my character be built in either place? God, can't you do these things in either place? And, and as I was kind of wrestling and fighting back and pushing back against that question, I felt like God spoke to me again. And this doesn't happen to me all the time. This is one of the few times that it's happened. Uh, God, I felt like God said back to me, if you go, you'll build a great career. But if you stay, I'll build your character. So after hearing that, what else can you do other than turn the call down and stay where you are? And that's exactly what I did. But let me tell you, I was not happy about that at all. I was mad at God. I was frustrated. I wanted to go so badly, I think for a lot of the wrong reasons. Today we're talking to up-and-comers. That's kind of our, our topic today. We're talking to those of you who are up-and-comers, the rising stars of your industries. We're talking to those of you who see yourselves as the brightest and best of your, of your class. Uh, we're talking to the people who consistently outperform and outdress and outearn and probably outspend all of your peers. And this isn't just something that's for young people. No, this, is, this isn't it at all. I mean, some of you, you have been up and comers for a long time. You keep pushing the boundaries. You keep showing up at, at the head of, of the pack. And for some of you, maybe you don't see yourself as an up and comer, but maybe you aspire to be that kind of person. A person who's seen as successful, a person that other people admire, the envy of others, the person that others wish they could be. And today, I, I want to just get to a really important question. I'm not going to make you wait for it. A really important question that, uh, that I think up-and-comers almost never ask themselves. I know at age 29, I was not asking myself this question. And I think it's a question that, that few of us, whether you consider yourself an up-and-comer or not, I think few of us ask ourselves this question. But it's such an important question, and our failure to ask this question is what often leads us to dangerous places. It's often what, what causes our lives to, to start to come apart at the seams. It's an important question that I want you to take note of, and the question is this. What's driving you really? Or you can personalize it. What's driving me really? See, I know we answer this question, what's driving me, and, and we've got all of these politically correct answers for it, right? Well, I just want to make a lot of money because I think it'd be nice to, to give money away and be helpful to people. And that may be true, but, but this is a deeper question. What's driving me really? What's, what's really going on under the surface? See, this question is so much more important than all of the other questions we tend to ask. Questions like, oh, well, how much does it pay? What are my benefits? Or questions we ask of each other, you know, like, What's on your resume? What are your accomplishments? What have you achieved? Where do you live? How much do you make? See, we ask questions all the time of each other. We ask questions all the time of, of other people. But, but this question is so much more important. And I think the failure to ask this question is the reason that so many once up-and-comers, you know, are an up-and-comer today, I think that's why they become the, the, the train wrecks of tomorrow. And you've all seen this. Someone who is that, that rising star in your company or that celebrity, or that politician, or even, even clergy. We, none of us are immune from this. One day they are, the, they are the rising star of their world, and the next day their life is a shambles, they're, they're a total train wreck. And I think the reason that happens, I believe, is the failure to ask this very important question, what's driving me really? And I want to show you today from Paul's letter to the Galatians, that's what we're studying in the series, chapter 5, it's the fifth part of our series, I want to show you today why this is such an important question, why this question is more important than so many other questions that we ask ourselves, and so we're going to look along right now. You can open up your Bible, you can go to your smartphone and go to version and look up STGSTL, or you can look along right here on the screen. So we're going to just jump right into the middle of it. Paul says, so I say, walk by the Spirit, and you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. For the flesh desires what is contrary to the spirit, and the spirit what is contrary to the flesh. They are in conflict with each other, so that you are not to do whatever you want. So if you don't understand what Paul is saying, I think you do understand this. You understand the tension that he's describing. A tension in your desires. 
right? I, th I think we all understand this. Who doesn't understand this? That in our lives there are these two forces at work. One of them he calls our flesh. And that can be described as our human nature, or our sinful nature. It's all of the stuff that comes so naturally and common to us, but it's not always the good stuff. And then on the other side, there's this other opposing force or this other opposing drive. Notice he doesn't call it conscience here. Because conscience is something different. I, th I think conscience more often than not belongs to the flesh because a conscience can be twisted, it can be manipulated, it can be numbed. A conscience can even be heightened, right? I mean, how many of us have felt bad for things that aren't even, they're, they're not even bad, but, but somewhere along the way someone turned up the knob on our conscience and our conscience became oversensitive. You know, Paul says that on one side you've got the flesh and on the other side you've got this thing called the spirit. Now maybe that's you know, kind of weird for you, um, let's talk a little bit about what the Spirit is. Let's just define this a little bit more. The Spirit is God's own presence with us first. So back in, back in the old days, back in the Old Testament days, God would give his presence to certain people. He would, he would pour it out on a king or a prophet or a priest. But now it's different. Since Jesus has come and opened up the way to God for all of us, since the Holy Spirit came on Pentecost, now God's Spirit is available to all of us. So, so God's own presence with us, God dwelling with us, that happens through His Spirit. God is not in heaven far off. The Father maybe is. Jesus is sitting at the right hand of the Father. But, but God's presence through His Holy Spirit is with us. The Spirit of Christ dwells with us now. Uh, the second part is uh, that God's Spirit gives us and keeps us in faith. It gives us faith and it keeps us in faith. And maybe you've experienced this, that sometimes after you've come to faith, there are moments where you would like to walk away from your faith, where you're done, you're frustrated, you're filled with doubts, and yet there's something that's holding you there. Well, that's God's Spirit. That's what the Spirit does. Thirdly, the Spirit does battle against our destructive tendencies. We're going to talk a lot about this today. Fourth, the Spirit is given in baptism. See, see, not everyone is just born with the Spirit of God, but the Spirit of God is poured out just like it was on Jesus. It's poured out on us and our baptism. Now, God's Spirit can work in other ways, um, but as we just saw, God's Spirit is given fully, a full measure of His Spirit is given to us in baptism, which gives us all kinds of other gifts. And then lastly, God's Spirit can be given in varying measure. Now, now this is something that is maybe a little controversial, but, but, but I believe this is true, that as I read the Bible, I notice that it's not just do you have the Spirit or not, but some people really seem to have the Spirit or live in the Spirit, and others do not. And, and that makes a huge difference in, in the rest of our lives and in the quality of life, of life that we live. So Paul describes these two tensions, okay? He describes the flesh, which we all know. It's what's common to us. It's what's normal to us. And then he describes the Spirit of God that is given to some of us in baptism, given to all of us in baptism. Um, and, uh, and, and he talks about how these things are in conflict, and I love the way he described that. He said, so that you're not able to do whatever you want. <laughs> have, have you noticed that in life? That there are sometimes you want to do something and you're just not able to do it. Because there's this conflict, there's this standoff in your drives, in your desires. Sometimes that can be a good thing. Sometimes it's, uh, it's uh, you know, this conflict is keeping you from doing bad things. Has this ever happened to you where, where you, man, you're just... You, you know what's right and wrong, and you just, you just want to do the wrong thing. You want to do the bad thing. You're hell-bent on doing something that's not good or healthy, that's going to have bad consequences, and you don't care. You're going to do it anyway. And, and so you kind of resign yourself to do that, and then there's this, this force inside of you that goes, no, don't. I was talking to a friend last week. I hear stories about this all the time. I was talking to a friend last week, and uh, he was describing this very thing, how one night he was going to go out and party with his friends, and thought it was going to be fun and was looking forward to it. And a few minutes before he left, he just felt overwhelmed with the sense of, no, don't go tonight. And he was kind of confused by that, but it felt so strong that he didn't go. And as it turns out, that night his friends got in a car accident. Um, a few of them were, were seriously injured. Who knows what would have happened to him if he were in the car himself. And, and he sees that as, whoa, I wanted to do this thing, but, but God spared me. Maybe you've experienced something like that. Sometimes this standoff works out in our, our benefit. It keeps us from doing things that would be hurtful to us or hurtful to others. Sometimes this, this standoff doesn't work out in our favor. I mean, have you ever wondered why it's so hard to, to exercise and eat healthy? Or why it's so difficult to pick up the phone or schedule coffee to have that difficult conversation with someone that you know you need to talk to in order to heal a relationship? Or why is it so difficult to pray? You know, why do I always fall asleep when I pray at night? 
Why is it so hard for me to pick up my Bible and read it? I can read everything else. I can read a cereal box quicker than I can read my Bible. Why is that so difficult for me? Why is it so difficult for me to invite that friend to church? Again, the reason it's difficult is because there are these opposing forces that are at war within us. And sometimes they keep us from doing the good things that we want to do. Sometimes they restrain us from doing the bad things. But, but we all know this tension. So what do you do about it? I mean, how do you not live life in constant tension? How do you keep from being paralyzed by these oppos- opposing forces that are at work with you, uh, at work in you? So Paul's going to describe this here next. He says, but if you are led by the Spirit, and this is important, this is what we're going to talk about today. If you are driven by the Spirit, if the Spirit is a thing that is driving you really, then uh, you're not under the law. You're not under regulations. You're, you're under freedom. And we've been talking a lot about that throughout this book. Uh, and we'll talk about this more later. But then I want, he describes what this looks like. He says, okay, so so let me back up a step. He says, the acts of the flesh are obvious. Things like sexual immorality, impurity, and debauchery. Idolatry and witchcraft, hatred, discord, jealousy, fits of rage, selfish ambition, dissensions, factions, and envy, drunkenness, orgies, and the like. I warn you, as I did before, that those who live like this will not inherit the kingdom of God. Now, those seem like some pretty strong words there. But just uh, so you understand what this means and what it doesn't mean, we've taught about this recently. Now, that doesn't mean that if you, if you do any of those things, if you get drunk, if you're jealous, that you don't go to heaven. No, I mean, those things may eventually get in the way of your faith. But what, what Paul's saying here is that those things, if, if you make a decision to live by those things, if you let those things drive you, what will happen is that you will miss out on greater things that God wants to give you. See, that's what it means to inherit the kingdom of God, to, to inherit the reign and rule of God in your life. See, God wants to bring good things into your life. He wants to give you a rich inheritance of, of, of wonderful things, awesome things. And yet, if we keep choosing to be led by our flesh, if we keep choosing to go that way, then, then what will happen is that we, we will forego the really good things that God gives us. Now, the reason this gets confusing is because often in life, we think we are headed toward good things. We, we believe we're chasing after good things. But in the end, Paul says, if, if the wrong thing is driving you, it doesn't matter how good it looks on the surface, in the end, it will lead you to really, really bad places. If you give into the flesh, you won't have the richness that God wants for you. And just let me explain this kind of simply and crassly. You know, if God wants for you health, and that's part of your inheritance, that's part of what his reign and rule wants to bring into your life, you, you can accept that and let God do that for you, or you can choose the jelly donut, right? We have a choice here. Or if God wants to give you strong relationships, that's something he wants to give you, you, you can make the choice instead to watch TV. Um, or if you want success at work and God wants to give that to you, if you surf the internet all day long at work, you're, you're going away from the things that even God wants to give to you. So Paul says, you know, if you let yourself be driven by the flesh... I know it may sound good, it may sound better, but it's not better. You will miss out on your inheritance. So what does that inheritance look like? Well, he he describes it um, in part here. He says, but the fruit of the Spirit, the things that God will give you if you're you're led by the Spirit, is love, joy, peace, forbearance, or patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Against such things, there is no law. I love this phrase, against such things there is no law, because we all know that when we live life by the flesh, you can't have too much of a good thing, or, or what's you know, perceived to be a good thing. That if you live your life driven by the flesh, you will end up with, with too much, and it'll send you to, to rehab, it'll send you to jail, it'll send you, you know, to, to bad health. But here Paul says, you know what, if you let yourself be driven by the Spirit, not only will God give you good things, but there's no limit on those things. You can't have too much of those things. Those things won't make you sick, they won't make you tired, they won't get you in trouble with anyone. They won't even make people jealous of you. Against those things, there is no law. Do you see? It's all about drives. The question is, what's driving you really? Right? And what happens in life is, is we look at the stuff in our life and we say, well, I don't want to be so envious. And so we try to tackle envy. And I don't want to be, I don't want to, you know, over drink. And so I, I need to tackle that in my life. Or I want more joy. How do, how do I become more joyful? And here's what Paul is saying. He's saying, no, no, no. 
Stop paying attention to the results only. The real question is, what's driving you? Because if the right thing is in the driver's seat in your life, if you're being driven by the right thing, you will end up with the right results. And if you let yourself be driven by the wrong thing, you'll end up with the wrong results. It's all about what's driving you, really. I want you to see how Paul finishes this section. He says, those who belong to Christ, so so this is where it comes down to it. You've heard the case. You've heard what each does. Here's where it gets practical. Those who belong to Christ, uh, those who belong to Christ Jesus, I should say, have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. Since we live by the Spirit, let us keep in step with the Spirit. Now, Now, these are powerful, insightful words from Paul. But frankly... I don't fully get it. I don't understand what this means. Now, theologically, I do. I understand what it means. It means that if we've been baptized into Christ, if we've been given his spirit, something amazing has happened in our lives. That we have been crucified with Christ. Our sinful nature has been put to death. It's been nailed to the cross along with Christ. We are dead to our sins. And we are raised again to new life in the spirit. That is a theological reality. For all of us in this place who've been baptized into Christ. And if you've not been baptized into Christ, you've just seen it happen for you today. God wants that for you. It's an amazing next step in your faith journey. So I get this theologically. Practically is where I struggle. Because even though I know what Jesus has done for me, even though I know that I've been crucified with Christ and my sinful nature has been crucified, even though I I know that I have the Spirit of God living in me, the struggle doesn't go away. The tension doesn't fully resolve in my life. I I know that I'm a person who is still being driven by opposing and competing forces. I experience it in my life daily. I think if you're honest, you know you experience it too. Theologically, I know that I'm going to keep on experiencing that tension. Even though Christ has given me victory, I'm going to keep on experiencing that tension until Jesus comes back and he does something new in my flesh. But practically, this is what Paul is saying, I think. Practically, until that day, there are things that you can do practically to ensure as much as possible that what is driving you really is the Spirit of God rather than your sinful flesh. And I just want to close with a few practical points of things that you can do uh, to, to try to encourage the Spirit to be in the driver's seat in your life. The first is this, constantly check what's driving you. That, you know, that's the big question today. What's driving you really? Constantly ask yourself that question. Now, sometimes this is easy to figure out. I mean, we kind of know if we're being driven by the Spirit or the flesh in some things, especially if you know the Word of God. You know the kinds of things that the Word of God values and the kinds of things that, that the Scriptures say, hey, these are not good for you. And so, so a lot of the time it's easy. Sometimes it's not so easy though, right? Like when you're walking into a, a job offer to be a senior pastor somewhere and you're going, hey, this, this seems good, this seems right. It's still important in those moments to check what's driving you really. To say, is, is this about taking me towards love, joy, peace, and all the rest? Or is is this something that's a little darker? Now, with those trickier things, it's a lot harder. You you can't do this alone, which is why I say number two. um, Rely on the counsel of other spirit-driven people. Now, how do you find a spirit-driven person? Well, don't just go to church and ask anyone. Because just because you're sitting in a church doesn't mean you're spirit-driven, right? Right. Any more than being in a garage makes you a car. Just it doesn't equate necessarily, right? So how do you find somebody spirit-driven? Well, you look for someone who evidences the fruit of the Spirit as we just saw them listed. You look for someone who, who evidences um, high degrees of love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, and the rest. Now, now, here's the thing. You'll never find anyone who lives all those things perfectly. Because for them, the tension never goes away either. And they will also probably embody some of the things that are of the flesh. You'll see both of those things. But, but you know what I mean. There, there are just certain people who you know are wise in the Spirit. They're driven by the Spirit. And the fruit of the Spirit is obvious in their life. It doesn't mean they're infallible. It doesn't mean they're, they're you know, perfect. But it does mean that they know probably a little bit more than others about what it means to be Spirit-driven. And in those moments when you're confused, simply going to those people and asking for counsel can be so, so helpful. Because they have been there, they fought through some of those, those opposing forces, they know the right questions to ask, or if they know you well, they know some of your weaknesses, and they can look into your life and they can say, hey, I know that one of the things you struggle with, one, one of those things that just, you know, your flesh keeps 
rearing up is, is this issue, and are, are you sure that's not driving you here? It's really, really important to have people in your life who can do that, which is why we are so big on living life in groups with others, in small groups, in Ironman groups, in women's studies, having a community of other people who are trying to be spirit-driven to live your life with. The third, uh, cultivate healthy habits and disciplines. Now, I think sometimes we make too much of this. You know, we think it's all on us, and it's all about our habits and our disciplines, and it's not all about those things. But, but these are important nevertheless. See, I think the Spirit of God, I mean, you just got to know this. The Spirit of God in a battle with your flesh, the Spirit of God can always win. Right? God, God can defeat anything. He conquered the grave for goodness sakes. Nothing could get in, in God's way when he sets his mind to something. And so the Spirit of God living inside of you, it's not a fair fight. I mean, the Spirit, the Spirit wins every time. Unless we sabotage the work of the Spirit by supplying the enemy lines with, with, with resources. And I think this is where habits come into, into play, is that so often we're, we're living with negative habits, destructive habits, that feed into our flesh and make it stronger than it needs to be. We make the tension in the battle so much worse. I remember in my uh, former church meeting with a high school student, and uh, he came in to meet with me because he was struggling with anxiety, and, and he felt distant from God, and he was having a hard time sleeping, and, and he was really, really concerned about this. His parents were concerned about him too, just his mental health. And so I was meeting with him, and I started asking him some questions about his life. And just out of the blue, one of the questions I, I, I felt the need to ask him is I asked him, he's a young high school guy, I said, hey, do, do you look at porn at night? And I'll never forget his answer. I mean, he was so nonchalant as he answered. He answered, yeah, doesn't everybody? And, and you see, that was the problem. The Spirit of God was working in his life, and yet he was feeding into unhealthy things that were making the battle harder than it needed to be. I think in our lives, if we can at least cut off some of the negative habits, if we can stop feeding in daily to some of the things that are, that are destructive and, and fueling the side of our flesh, then it's, it's, it's a lot easier for the Spirit to have its way. But, but I think really, truly, it all lands on this. Invite the Spirit into your daily life. See, Jesus once was, was talking to a group of people, and he looked out, and there were some dads in the group, just like there are today. And he said, hey, those of you who are dads, don't you want to give good gifts to your children? And they all nodded, looked at each other, and said, yeah, of course, we want to give good gifts to our children. And he said, okay, then, if, if you, though you are, are sinful and you get confused sometimes, if you want to give good gifts to your children, how much more? Will your Father in heaven give the Holy Spirit to those who ask? See, I think part of the reason the tension and the battle is so overwhelming and strong sometimes, the reason we let our flesh get in the driver's seat and take us to undesirable places is because we're simply not asking for the Spirit in our daily life. Right now, let me ask you, when's the last time you prayed to God and said, God, give me your Holy Spirit? If it wasn't, you know, within the last few hours, then maybe you can do something to change that. Every night, um, I've gotten in this habit in the last year, I've just become convinced of this. This invitation is a way to surrender and to be open to God's Spirit. Every night at bedtime with my kids, we pray for this very thing. We ask for the Holy Spirit and for the fruit of the Spirit to become evidence in our life. See, this is what Jesus died to give you. You understand that this is part of your inheritance. Jesus hung on a cross and he gave his life not only to forgive your sins, that too, but, but he did it so that you would have access to this very exclusive spirit, the, the dwelling of God with you, the strength of God in your life. And how many of us leave that inheritance on the table, never asking God to give us the very thing that Jesus died for us to have, the very thing that God would love to send to us if we would only ask. See, again, the struggle doesn't go away. It'll never go away until Jesus comes back. But here's what I can say is, as you begin to live your life driven by the Spirit, here's what will happen. The fight will become maybe a little easier. It'll become a little less wearisome. And your life will become more filled with, with the fruit of the Spirit. See, in life, there are two paths to becoming an up-and-comer. There's the one that the world celebrates, and it looks good to us, and we get confused about it sometimes, but ultimately, it ends with things that are not good for us. It ends in broken relationships, broken health, uh, a loss of freedom. 
and a lot of regret. And then there's this other path that God wants to lead us on that leads to wholeness and fullness in all kinds of things against which there is no law. So keep asking that question, what's driving me really? And keep asking for God's spirit. In fact, let's do that right now. Please stand as we come before God, as we pray, as we confess. Bow your heads with me. Lord, we acknowledge that even though the victory of Jesus is final and complete and it's sufficient, and it's for us, we acknowledge that, that we prolong the battle. We feed into our flesh. We make decisions with wrong motives and our hearts get all twisted up and we seek after the, the wrong things. And God, right now, in just a moment of, of silence, we confess those drives inside of us that keep taking us toward dark things, destructive things, hurtful things. We confess those to you in a moment of silence. Father, today we ask not only for your forgiveness of all of those sins, and we pray that, that you would forgive us, that you would make us clean, that you would wash us, that you would renew us. But Father, today we ask for your Holy Spirit. Pour your Spirit on us generously, richly, so that we no longer are driven by our flesh, so that we're no longer driven to things that are dark and painful. Give us your Holy Spirit so that we might be driven to things that bring life and freedom and goodness. God, we're too weak to fight this battle on our own. You've never intended us to fight this battle on our own. We pray, though, you'd give us the wisdom to seek you and to ask what you have given us, what is now rightfully ours because of Christ, your Holy Spirit. We pray it in your strong name.